Good morning. morning. (laughs) Welcome. If you are new here among us, my name is Gene and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I wonder, is there anyone else here who isn't a big fan of flying? I know why Ed laughed. Not a big fan. Welcome back, my friend. (laughs) Not a big fan of flying. Now, I will not say that I have a fear of flying, but I just don't like it. There's something about being hurtled through the sky, 30,000 feet above where my feet should actually be. It's weird. I don't like it. But I'll tell you what. Here's where I do get afraid. I'm being honest. When I have to get into one of those little puddle jumpers, these are the planes you have to take when the place you're going to does not have an airport that can accommodate a proper plane, a big plane, whatever they're called. Anyway, puddle jumper. (laughs) Kind of scary sometimes, especially if you don't do it a lot, you're not used to it. I heard a story of a pastor who had a similar fear of these puddle jumpers, but he was forced to go to a place where he had to take one. So he prayed, and then he got on the plane. On this plane, there were three other people, clearly the pilot, the pastor, a genius, and a Boy Scout. Oh, there's going to be a joke here, yes. So they get on the plane, it's going well at first, they take off well, it seems pretty smooth, until they hit some turbulence, things bouncing all over the place. The pastor looks out the window and notices that the propeller is not spinning. (laughs) So he says to the pilot, is that supposed to not be doing that? Nope. We're going to crash. And guess what? This ain't the Navy, so I don't need to go down with the ship. I'm jumping out of the plane. Hope you're good with that. Here's the problem. There's four of us and only three parachutes. Uh Uh-oh. Well, I got a wife and kids. I'm out. He jumps out of the plane. (laughs) Now the genius gets up and he says, listen, guys. I am one of the smartest people in the world. So the world clearly needs me. I'm out. Jumps out. It's plane. So now the pastor looks at the Boy Scout and says, well, I guess this is where the rubber meets the road, where my faith is really being put to the test. I got to prove it. So, son... I've lived a full life. I'm going to make this sacrifice for you. The Boy Scout interrupts the sermon. He says, relax, pastor. You know that genius? He just jumped out of the plane with my backpack on. (laughs) They're not always funny. This one, I think, was pretty good. (laughs) All right, today we find ourselves in the rest of the story. This is where we are looking at the full counsel of God's Word, not just the books or verses that we like. All of it, we're going to deal with it, we're going to unpack it, and we're going to look at how it applies to us. We see that there are certain sections of the Bible that run in parallel, and it gets really confusing. I totally get it because then sometimes that stops. And that was last week, right? So we saw an account that would have been, if it were running perfectly in parallel, right in the middle of 1 Chronicles chapter 20. Ten chapters. And that's another thing we're doing. We're looking at the whole story. So sometimes it's one chapter. Sometimes it's ten chapters because we get a complete picture of it. So we really understand the story. When we break it up, I gave you that illustration. It's kind of like watching ten seconds of TV or a movie every week or something like that. And that's how people read the Bible, right? Just a little verse, and then to make it worse, they jump all over the place. You're never going to get it. If you watch a two-hour movie 10 seconds at a time, by the time you're done in two years, you're not going to understand it. And that's a problem. So we're trying to resolve that a little bit and get you guys used to just looking at bigger chunks of the story. Today, 
we come into alignment where 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles actually now line back up. And so we're going to look at one story, just one chapter. Easy week for me today. Right, my wife is laughing because she knows. So we're in 1 Chronicles 21, if you're following along, and 2 Samuel 24. We've been looking at the life of David. We're taking our time going through these accounts. David is talked about a lot in the Bible. So you're going to hear a lot more about him, especially today. Last week, we saw he suffered tremendous betrayal. So David doesn't always get everything right, but he doesn't always get everything wrong either. So we're going to see this again today. David takes a census. 2 Samuel 24, 1. Once again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he caused David to harm them by taking a census. Go and count the people of Israel and Judah. The Lord told him. 1 Chronicles 21.1, Satan rose up against Israel and caused David to take a census of the people of Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, take a census of all the people of Israel from Beersheba in the south to Dan in the north and bring me a report so I may know how many there are. Hmm. That's interesting. So what's going on here? We have different accounts. So these are the parallel accounts of the same exact thing. Seems a little different, doesn't it? Bothers some people. Well, we can resolve it. That's what we're going to work on. It's kind of like the Gospels. You have different perspectives of the same thing going on. Sometimes one author will decide not to include other things that he knows an other author covered already. Kind of what we have going on on here in this. The chronicler (laughs) gives us a little bit more information. So remember, when we have these parallel accounts, they're not creating contradictions. The Word of God does not do that. They just give us different perspectives and more information. So what do we probably have going on here? One, David's prideful right now. He's got a real big army, and he wants to talk himself up. Pride. That's what's going on. So, what does Satan do? Encourages it. Yeah, you're awesome, David. What do our parents often do when we're wrong? Go ahead. Do it. That's probably what we have going on here in these two accounts. We get more information by looking at both. Now, if we're looking at the story and you're reading along, you see that at first, Joab, his general, protests. Why are you going to cause Israel to sin, David? Don't do this. What's wrong with this? Well, again, David's very prideful. I'm going to hop around a little bit for you. He doesn't need to take the census. He's boasting in his own strength. There's also a possibility, because it doesn't mention this if you're reading carefully, and this is a really good I guess, example of why we really need to be in the Word. So these things are kind of in recent memory. If you remember in Exodus, it was a while ago for some of you, but if you've been reading the Word, it's not. If you remember in Exodus 20, what does Moses get? Ten Commandments, right? But we know if we're reading all of it that there's more. There's like 613 different commandments that he gets. One of them is regarding the census. If you take a census, there's a command. There's something he's supposed to be doing. Exodus 30, verse 12. Whenever, so this is okay, you take a census of the people of Israel, each man who is counted must pay a ransom for himself to the Lord. Then, pay attention to this and remember it, back pocket, then no plague will strike the people as you count them. Each person who is counted must give a small piece of silver as a sacred offering to the Lord. Neither of these accounts mention anybody collecting a tax or anybody paying anything. So keep that in mind. It's not there. But the real sin here in the beginning of this account is David's pride. That's what we have to remember. Now, although Joab protests, King David insists. So they travel around for nine months and 20 days, gathering up these numbers. Now, if you're looking at both of them, you're going to say, "Uh uh-oh, the numbers don't line up. They're not the same. 2 Samuel, 800,000 men who are capable with the sword, some translations say, 
In Israel, the north, and in Judah, the south, 500,000 people. In Chronicles, 1,100,000 people and 470,000 people in Judah. What is going on? Well, the commentaries say different things. Here's what I think from my pastoral perspective. If someone comes in, and let's say I have 470 people in my church as a pastor, you know what I'm probably going to do when someone asks me how many people there are? 500. We round up, right? We're not trying to be exact, and maybe we've got a little pride like David. We're taking our senses. My church is bigger than your church. Some people do that, okay? And I've told you in the past, 2 Samuel is not intended to be a very technical account. It's a personal account. 1 Chronicles is extremely technical. If you've ever read it, you know that the first nine chapters, you barely made it to chapter 10 because it's a lot of names and numbers of people. This is what it's like. The chronicler is more concerned with being technically accurate. So I think we can move on and let that resolve itself. But here's what happens. Afterward, David's conscience begins to bother him. He wants forgiveness now. So the Lord, he sends the seer or prophet Gad, like Nathan, to deliver a message. Some punishments. Three choices. Now, here's something that I'm going to sidebar for you. And it's kind of important. A lot of people wouldn't pay too much attention to it. A lot of people don't. But you should. Because a lot of Bible translations, three is really important here. You got three punishments, and each one is in a three. So if you're reading along, it should say three years of famine in the land. Now, if you go to 1 Chronicles 21, it'll say that no matter what version you're reading. But if you're back in 2 Samuel 24, it might say seven. That is a contradiction. And so you have my permission to cross it out and write three. That's what the better versions are going to say. It's a mistake. It is not that way in the earliest translation. So we can have confidence in the word of God. It does not contradict itself. If you look at the Septuagint, the Bible of the early church, a.k.a. the Bible of the apostles, it will say seven. If you look at older manuscripts, it will say seven in 2 Samuel. So if you're looking at a translation that does not, it's actually an error. It is a mistake. Cross it out, write three, get a better version. Anyway, three years of famine, three months of devastation by your enemies, or three days of plague. Plague. Remember that in Exodus? What happens if they don't pay the tax? David chooses plague. And it could be because now he's paying attention to God's word. Ooh, I didn't collect the tax maybe, so that's the punishment I get. He says, let me fall into the hands of the Lord not the hands of men. That's his reasoning. 70,000 people die. And now we get a picture of the death angel of the Lord holding his sword over Jerusalem. Again, we can go back to Exodus, and this is kind of what Moses tells the people. All right, so for those who have their doorposts painted with the blood of the lamb, the death angel will not strike those people down. So it's a picture of the death angel getting ready to strike Jerusalem. But God stops the angel. Stop it. It's enough. Now, at this point, the angel is at a very important place. He's at the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. And I'll explain to you later why this place is very, very important in the story and the rest of the story. If we jump ahead, when Aruna sees the death angel, he's terrified. And so are his four sons. Only First Chronicles gives us the four sons. They take off. Aruna stays. And David sees the angel, jump back a little bit, puts on a sackcloth, face to the floor, repents. All right, so forgiveness. Please save Jerusalem. Remember in last week's account, he was concerned about Jerusalem. He says something important. I am the one who sinned. Strike me down, my family, not your people. Well, the Lord has told him, stop. The angel of the Lord tells Gad to tell David to build an altar on this spot. 
the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. What is a threshing floor? I'm glad you asked instead of just sitting there pretending you knew. Of course, if you raised your hand, I wouldn't call on you anyway. It's in the middle of a sermon. Wait till I'm done. But I'll tell you. <laughs> A threshing floor, so they would thresh out the wheat. They'd get like a weed or a barley harvest, and they're going to separate, so they get the grain out from the chaff. And so what they're going to do, usually, sometimes, they will beat it out. They have like special tools to do this, and so they beat it out. Or if they have them, they get oxen or animals, sometimes a donkey, something like that, and they pull like a board over it. And these animals, as important in the account, are yoked together. A yoke is something that attaches two animals. You need two because this thing's heavy. It's got to be heavy because that's what's going to separate the chaff from the grain. When they're done, they're usually going to wait till the evening when it's cooler and breezy. And they're going to take a winnowing fork, like a pitchfork, and they're going to throw the stuff up in the air. And the wind is going to blow the chaff away. The grain is going to fall to the ground. Allergy nightmare. Anyway, this is, this is a threshing floor. So there's an exchange now. Aruna, this guy who owns the threshing floor, he bows to King David and his men as they approach. What do you want? I want the threshing floor. Aruna's like, take it. And he gives him the idea. I'm going to build an altar. Okay, you can repurpose everything here. It's made out of wood. You can use that for the fire to burn the sacrifice, have the animals. He's parsing it out. Kind of important because we're going to see more numbers here. David insists on pain. Here's his reasoning. First Chronicles 21, 24. But King David replied to Aruna, no, I insist on buying it for the full price. I will not take what is yours and give it to the Lord. I will not present burnt offerings that have cost me nothing. And here, the Bible gives us different numbers, depending on what account you're reading. Now, this one is a little easier to explain because some Bible translations will talk about the weight of the gold. Some will talk about the amount of the gold. So it can be a little different. It's a little different in both of the accounts, but probably because of what Aruna said, he's parsing it out. So this is the cost of the oxen. This is the cost of the yoke. This is the cost of the property of the threshing floor. And so one account's focusing on one, the other account's focusing on the other. Again, more details. The point, David repurposes the materials, he makes the altar, fire in 1 Chronicles comes down from heaven, burns up the offering. 1 Chronicles 21, 27, then the Lord spoke to the angel who put the sword back into its sheath. When David saw that the Lord had answered his prayer, he offered sacrifices there to ruin his threshing floor. At that time, the tabernacle of the Lord and the altar of burnt offering that Moses had made in the wilderness were located at the place of worship in Gibeon. But David was not able to go there to inquire of God because he was terrified by the drawn sword of the angel of the Lord. We're going to keep reading. It's going to be important for the next part. First Chronicles 22.1. Then, interesting, it starts with, then David said, this will be the location of the temple of the Lord God and the place of the altar for Israel's burnt offerings. This is a really important account, and a lot of people leave this out. So this is when and where the place for the temple was determined. It's really important. And in First Chronicles, it's very interesting. We're going to concentrate on some of this material. First Chronicles is going to lay out all of these plans for the temple. David's going to get the materials from Tyre, all this stuff. And so it'll keep going in First Chronicles, the detail, because he's preparing it for Solomon. And you have to pay attention to that. Because otherwise, if you hop over to First Kings, you'll get confused. So here in Second Samuel 24, it ends. That's it. And it goes into 1 King, Kings, where David's an old man. And then you'll see Adonijah will try to take the throne. If you're just reading that account, you're not getting it all. You have to go over to 1 Chronicles where David makes it very clear that Solomon is the next king. And you go to 1 Kings and go, oh, that's what's wrong with this situation. So this is a good example of you, you kind of do need to jump around and get it. But in the series, I'm putting it together for you. So hopefully it makes more sense. Sometimes, pride can be like a parachute. We need to check it. Before we jump, we need to check it. 
And likewise, before we jump to conclusions, we need to check it. It must be checked. Both the parachute and the pride. And maybe there are certain occasions where we shouldn't jump at all because Jesus didn't. Bear with me. Again, the Gospels, they give us different points of information. So Mark will give us a little less, 16 chapters. The Gospel of immediately, it gets right to it. It says immediately a lot. Jesus is just moving right along. Starts right with his ministry, focused on snapshots of this ministry, moves quick. Matthew kind of takes his time. He adds more, 28 chapters. Gives us a little bit more information, early life of Jesus, and some more details about what happens within his ministry. Jesus begins his earthly ministry by fasting. That's an interesting point. We should probably pay a little bit more attention to that. It's fasting in the Bible. Do Christians do that anymore? We should. He begins his ministry by fasting. He's probably hungry. He's impelled into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit 40 days and 40 nights where the devil tempts him. He tempts his hunger. Ah, if you're the son of God, turn this stone into a piece of bread. No, we don't live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Matthew 4, starting at verse 5, Then the devil took Jesus to the holy city Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. This is interesting. That's the site we were looking at today, isn't it? Where Aruna's threshing floor was. The devil took him to the highest point of the temple and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, He will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt, hurt your foot on a stone. <laughs> Jesus responded, The scriptures also say, You must not test the Lord your God. So on the same spot in our account today of David, when Jesus was tempted, he passed the tests by not testing God. He cited scriptures. He didn't do what he already knew was wrong. Our pride will often lie to us, as we've discussed in past weeks, and tell us that we can get away with something, and Satan will be right there to encourage it to tell us that it's okay. He wants us to be self-reliant, overly self-confident, so that we fall. That's what he wants. God wants us to be reliant on him, so we don't fall for these schemes. He wants us to be obedient to his word, so we already know what is wrong. Satan tempts, but God provides us with a way out. 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth where they're having some problems in the context of meat sacrifice to idols. He says this, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted... He will show you a way out so that you can endure. In our account today, ironically, it is Joab that provides David with a way out that he didn't take. In each situation, you are presented with options. They're there. And one of those is a way out a pathway away from your pride. Now, here's the thing. I've found that Christians are really good lawyers, or at least you would all be, most anyway. 
They're good at lawyering things. And so here's what people will say. I'm going to take this away from you this morning. (laughs) But there wasn't a way out. It was my only choice. Mm -hmm. Maybe at that point, you'd already made the choice. The sin begins with our motive. Perhaps Satan told your pride to tell you to get in a situation that you shouldn't have been in in the first place. Maybe. In other words, we often get deep in the mistake way before the actual mistake. Often our pride will tell us, you can play with this fire and not get burned. The Word of God tells us something different. And this is why we need to be in the Word a lot. So we're listening to God, not Satan, before we get burned, not after. Okay, nobody's perfect, including me. (laughs) I'm not. So let's answer another question. What happens if we get burned? Right, what do we do? Well, we see in today's account, there's an answer here. We see what David did right. First Chronicles 21, starting at verse 16. David looked up and saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth with his sword drawn, reaching out over Jerusalem at that point in the account. So David and the leaders of Israel put on burlap to show their deep distress and fell face down on the ground. And David said to God, I am the one who called for the census. I am the one who has sinned and done wrong. But these people are as innocent as sheep. What have they done? Oh, Lord, my God, let your anger fall against me and my family. Do not destroy your people. What David did right was admit when he was wrong. That's hard, isn't it? Let's do a little exercise today. Here's what I want you to do. (laughs) I want you to think of something that you've done wrong, but you didn't take any responsibility for it. Think of something, maybe you're perfect, I don't know, but I can think of like something yesterday, this morning. (laughs) No, but think of something that you might have done wrong, but you didn't take responsibility for it. And if you wanna lighten it up, go easy. I'll give you some possibilities. (laughs) Maybe, You're driving, and your spouse is in the car. And maybe it's like Saturday, but you start driving to work. You ever do that? You're on autopilot, and you're not thinking, and you just drive somewhere you're not supposed to be going. Then maybe your spouse says, why are you going the wrong way? And then instead of saying, oh man, I was wrong, that was stupid, you go, no, 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 I went this way on purpose. Right? Because I, I forgot something at the depot. The home depot. We're going to the depot today, and that's it. But we're going to be late for the movie. No, 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 it won't take long at all. What do you got to get? And then, like, I don't know, you know, like a hose, something like that. And then you keep, I call these sitcom lies. They're sitcom lies, right? It's a premise for every good sitcom episode ever. Right? You watch the episode, and the person does something wrong or lies, or something goes wrong, and then they just do all these other things to cover it up, and you're watching the whole time, like, Oh, this is hard. Are you like that too? This is hard to watch. Why didn't they just tell the truth in the beginning? Because there'd be no episode. So anyway, I call it sitcom lies. They're kind of funny. How far did you go? I've told you in the past about how to get out of tickets. If you're new here today, you learn all kinds of cool stuff at C3 Church. You can ask Deputy Johnson. He'll tell you. I'm probably right on this one. How to get out of a ticket? I was wrong. I'm sorry. The worst things you can do. Well, there's a third one I'll tell you, but I hope none of you are doing this. But anyway, when you get pulled over, you shouldn't say, he's going to say this. Do you know why I pulled you over? Don't say, I don't know. Because there are two logical conclusions. You are stupid or you're drunk. That's it. So don't say that. That's very, very foolish. You shouldn't do that at all. I did that by accident once, and it led to more problems. I got, like, sobriety field tests and all this other stuff. 
I told you the story a while back. Don't say that. Also, don't say, I pay your salary. <laughs> yeah. Not going to go well. <laughs> Very bad. Don't do that. <laughs> Best thing you can do. I'm sorry. Acknowledge what you, be like David. Acknowledge what you did. Take responsibility for it. Now, here's the thing. You might say, but then I admitted to it. I'm definitely going to get a ticket. Not always. Not always. But if you do, like David, it will probably stop there. If you do not, oh, you're going to get more tickets. Ask Deputy Johnson. He'll tell you. He's going to bang you up for some more stuff. and say, no, 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 write you some tickets. But if you say, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry I was wrong, I, I add, I'm sorry I made you get out of the car, especially if it's raining, Ugh, I'm sorry. And sometimes they'll say, hey, go ahead. It's nice that you were agreeable with me today. But if you do get a ticket, it's probably going to stop there because you said, I was wrong. So here's what we're going to do together. Get that thing back in your head. It could have been a traffic stop. Might have been. Something in your head where you blamed somebody else. It was the car, why didn't you pull over the guy in front of me? Another bad thing to say. You didn't see that? <laughs> well, something you blamed somebody else for, right? And we're going to redeem ourselves here. We're going to do an exercise together. Here's what I want you to admit. We're going to say, I was wrong. Ready? I was wrong. It's freeing. It's actually freeing. Somebody just said, no, it's not. <laughs> when I see people like arguing with all their, they have these points, these principles, and they're arguing and arguing, fighting and arguing, doing everything that the Bible tells us not to do, do. Arguing, angry, I see people who are prisoners of their own pride. That's it. Imaginary fights in their head. Talked about a Bible study. Renting space in your head. You're letting people do that. Prisoners of your own pride. Try it. I was wrong. And you know what? It's disarming. You just say that I was wrong. You might not always be able to say it in every scenario, but I've told the staff this. It's how we teach our people here. If it's something you can let go of, you're right. It may not be totally true, and you don't always want to say that, right? You do have certain principles you want to stick with, but come on, if we're being honest, what are these principles really all about? Your pride, right? It's about your pride, your anger. We talked about that. You're angry because you're afraid, but it's about your pride. Let it go. We had this one situation. I told one of our staff members, I'm like, just try it out. You know what? You're right. <laughs> Came back to me and said, it worked. The person was shocked. <laughs> They're like, it's glitched. They didn't know what to do. Like, I know. They came looking for a fight. Don't give it to them. You're right. Maybe I was, they put maybe in there. Maybe I was wrong. Pastor Wayne, my... My mentor, our overseer, taught me that. He used to say that all the time. I could be wrong, but, and he was right. <laughs> but you see, it made us feel good. I could be wrong. Not about everything, but come on. Most of the stuff we're arguing about, really, it's not that important. I don't see too many Christians doing serious apologetics on Facebook. It's not about that. It's about something else, if we're being honest. I pick on Facebook and all the kids are telling me, Pastor Gene, stop talking about, we're not there anymore. But you're not the ones arguing. <laughs> this is an area where the kids are getting it right. They ran away from Facebook to get away from all the old people who are arguing about the things that aren't really important to them. It's funny because it's true. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to tell you where they went because then you'll go there and ruin that too. And the last thing we need is another social media platform. So you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you 
We are called to be countercultural. Do you know that? Countercultural. The word of God does not read like the world. It's nothing like it. Anybody who reads the New Testament a lot, you're like, wow. This is very, very different from all the instructions we're given here in the world. Countercultural. And in today's culture, doesn't it seem like everybody is trying to blame somebody else for something? That's our culture. We need to be counter that. No blaming. It was me. I'm the one who called the census. I was wrong. I'll take the punishment. It's my fault. Counter cultural. We are to love people in a crazy way. It should blow. That's the point. That's what Paul is writing about. Peter's writing about. Read First Peter all the way through. Woo! That's different. We did that at Bible study a couple weeks ago. Shocking to some even longtime Christians. What? I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Someone's beating me, persecuting me, torturing me. Thank you. I love you. I bless you. I hope God blesses you. It's what it says. Ever hear the phrase, kill him with kindness? You hear that? Kill him with kindness. We looked at Romans chapter 12. Really hard chapter to read sometimes. We're to be transformed. Really the way we worship is by loving people. We're to be a living sacrifice. That is worship. That is worship. The singing and all that other stuff, it's just an extension of true worship if we're getting that part right. Otherwise, and I've said it before, you guys don't like it, but that's okay because it's true. Otherwise, if we're not getting the sacrificial love part right, we're singing a bunch of lies. That's it. But for those really trying to get it right, those with really repentant hearts, it's just the singing is just an extension of the real deal. The real part. Getting it right. Being a sacrifice. Told you what Paul said. Repeating Jesus' word. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse. Bless. Don't return insults for insults, people. Bless them. But he goes on to say something, and I'll I'll go a little deeper into it. He's quoting Proverbs 25. He's saying when you do that, it's going to be like lumping burning coals on their head. Do not do that to anyone. (laughs) But it's like that. He's saying, kill them with kindness. Kill them with kindness. You know what else he says? Don't think you know it all. Don't think you know it all. Instead, I could be wrong. Don't think you know it all. But in our pride, we miss that point. In our pride, we develop principles. In our pride, we develop principles and we forget about our purpose. We must always remember our purpose. If we go to 2 Corinthians, after 1 Corinthians, we get to chapter 5, kind of important. It says this. He's saying, we're a new creation. We're a new creation. If you're born again... You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. New, not like the old. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus for all this good stuff we're supposed to be doing. He talks about our purpose. He says what we are. 2 Corinthians 5, starting at verse 18. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task God has given us this task, that's our job, of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. So we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Come back to God. Anyone have a pet? Last night, putting the kids to bed. (laughs) That is the pet and my daughter. The dog runs under the bed. (sighs) 
And now they're trying to get the dog. Well, my wife is really smart. I picked the bed up. <laughs> right? You know, I, uh, I picked the bed up. We had some teamwork going on. It was pretty cool. But anyway, the dog is really smart. But if you want to get the dog, what do you do? You don't go, because the dog's just going to, right? Go deeper under the bed. I'm going to come to you. She gets a treat. That's how you get the dog from under the bed with a treat. But our dog is so smart. Didn't work. So I had to lay down on top of the bed and like, get her. Anyway, you get the treat. Okay. Come back to God. Come to God. You say to your dog, come. Right? With a treat. Now let's just do not walk around, do street evangelism with candy. It's not what I'm saying. Don't do that. You might get arrested. But <laughs> come back to God. You don't go, come back to God. But do we do evangelism like that? Huh? With like signs condemning everybody else's sin? Well, not, you should put your own, I am a total sinner, I was wrong. And maybe later, when you sign up for Christianity, we'll talk about yours. But right now, I signed up already. And I got a lot going on. What do we do? Come to God. You have sinned. Ah! Is it effective? No, it's not. It's not. We're ambassadors. What do ambassadors do? You watch all these TV shows, you see ambassadors of things. They're kind and gracious. They take insults, right? Ambassadors saying, come back to God. We get them there with love. That's how it works. As we close, I think we need to ask ourselves a question. What would it look like? What would it look like if Jesus and the spread of the gospel, getting people to come back to God, were really the most important thing to Christians? We need to drop our prideful principles and pursue our purpose in Christ. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the people who came this morning, the people interested in being built up in you, digging into your word, binding us together by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray, I pray that we take that with us this week and we love others for the sake of of the gospel and your glory. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.